Those are with us tonight. In linea. I believe we are now online. I would like to welcome today, 31st of August. We have the pleasure of having with us from Peru, Lima, Peru, Hector Bejar, ex foreign minister for Peru. I'd also like to welcome from the Alliance of Global Justice, and in its name, everyone who is with us today. Firstly, I'd like to say that after a very difficult recount of the second round of elections, of the presidential elections, and after weeks of uh, legal trouble, the authority, the electoral authority, declared the candidate of Peru Libre to be the winner. Castillo was able to overcome the right, which was represented by Keiko Fujimori, who aspired for the third time for the presidency of the country. And she was unable to win once more. The announcement came uh, a few days after the elections that the new president of Peru for the 2021-2026 would uh, come to power in June. And this, in order to talk about these events in Peru, we will have As I said before, we're honored to have the foreign minister, the ex-foreign minister, Hector Rejar. But also we have Ray Vichel, who is part of the Teamster and part of the syndicate of train engineers and secretary of the Peru Libre uh, organization in the United States. Also, with us will be Freddie Mills from Bodhi State University and Director of uh, Affairs in Washington, D.C. We will also be closing the seminar with Terry Madsen, who is his presenter, uh, the weekly presenter of the program of WTF covering Latin America, and she's also part of the, of the tax force, director of the, part of the directors of the tax force. So we expect this to take around an hour, but we would also like to know that in your screens, you, you will see a button where you will be able to, to select the language that you would like. This will be being translated into English and simply, if you don't need to listen to it in English, you just leave it in Spanish. If you do need to listen it, listen to it in English, you just push on the button and you will activate uh, the English translation. Without uh, any more to say, I would like to leave the, the stage to Ray Vigil. Uh, who is representing Peru Libre in the United States. Hello, good evening, friends. I am Ray Vigil. I am the secretary of the Peru Libre organization here in the United States. Uh, I only want to say a little bit about Peru Libre. It's a leftist party, a uh, Marxist-Leninist party, and with a very broad base, especially uh, in the United States, we are growing. And obviously in Peru, the party is growing everywhere. And that's what's making us stronger. Peru Libre is the party that is now in government and it's allied with progressive parties that believe in change. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to be a part of this uh, chat with Hector Bejar Rivera 
he was born in Murachiri, a province of the Lima state. In a few days, he will be having his birthday. So congratulations, Hector. Hector Rejar is a prolific writer, sociologist, university professor, and one of the most recognized intellectuals in Peru. And he's a very good rep representative of the left in our country. We believe in a very large change and he's part of that. A very important thing of his history is the, and the words are the words of John Lewis's who said, never be afraid of making noise and be in trouble, but be in trouble in the type of trouble that is good and that is necessary. So uh, he was part, uh, Hector was part of the ELN the, in the 1960s. And he was, uh, he's very close to the, the Cuban revolution with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. He was in jail for five years and had received an amnesty from the revolutionary government of Juan Velasco Alvarado. That's why I said the words of John Lewis, because we shouldn't be afraid of being in trouble in the case that the, that trouble is necessary. He was invited to work with Juan Velasco Alvarado in the 1970s and was part of the agrarian reform in Peru. He also studied law in, in the University of San Marcos, arts, and then a postgraduate degree in sociology, also in the same university, and also in the Catholic University and the San Marcos University. Hector Vejar is a, a man of ideas and actions. In the days that he was in the foreign ministry, he moved the structures of the Peruvian government. We have been able to connect with him and to join this country. He was the bridge between intellectuals and, and, and those in the base. He, he was able to get us together and we're very thankful for that. He created an international bridge as well. On my part, as a part of the Peru Libre Party, we would like to continue to support our ex-foreign minister. So thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much, Ray, for those words. And with no more to say, we would like to, uh, we know that people are waiting to have a conversation with Hector Rejar, and we have a lot of messages already uh, greeting Hector, so we would like to to have him speak now and have him give us a synopsis, a, a summary of what's been happening in Peru the last few days. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray, for your presentation, and thank all of you for for coming to to this webinar. Um, I will make a very synthetic. Uh, summary, because what I want to do is have a conversation and and rather than make a, lo a long speech, what I would like to do is to answer the questions that you have in search for information and viewpoints, and also to, to exchange viewpoints with you. So let's start with the beginning. As Ray said, we are in, in, in a new government, truly new in the history of Peru, because the change means that for the first time, as you know, a school teacher from a faraway province of Peru is in the palace of government. And with him, people that also are new in government that, that don't belong to the elite in Peru. Who are they? They are people that are a part of a front, a political front, that is made up of several uh, leftist groups. There is, of course, the, the winner of the elections, Peru Libre, 
but there's also Juntos por el Perú, Frente Amplio, the Partido Humanista, and a cultural front whose representative has the Ministry of Culture at the moment, plus uh, figures that are independent. But this front that really represents an electorate that for the first time didn't vote in, in large part for the political elite in Peru and has provoked a reaction, a strong reaction from what is called the right in Peru, which really isn't a right uh, per se, but because they don't follow uh, political ideas, but rather economic and uh, ideas and interests. And these interests come from how the economic uh, side of Peru is actually organized. It's, a, it's made up of monopolies, mining monopolies, also banking, pharmaceutical, commercial, and a presence of the enormous production of cocaine, of highly pure cocaine, because as we can remember, Peru with Colombia, is one of the two countries that occupy the first place in production of highly pure cocaine. So at the same time that we produce very many millions of ounces of gold, we also produce a lot of thousands, several thousands of kilos of cocaine around 400,000 kilos a year of cocaine, according to official figures. But the real figures, of course, are much bigger, much higher. So this has the implication that there is a, a large power, political, uh, excuse me, economic power that is able to buy conscience in large part, the media, where there exists what we call the concentrated media, that is the monopoly of communication. Integrated by a few, maybe 14 newspapers, national newspapers, with their their slogan or their, their largest Canal. representative, which is El Comercio Newspaper. newspaper. There's three TV news stations with their respective national uh, repetitions, and also two or three networks of, of radio. All of that and uh, a group of, of commentators, political commentators, and radio hosts, radio hosts, all of them singing the same song and saying the same speech. This has been creating for many years in Peru a culture or a, a subculture, a political one, that of course justifies the, the current regimen with all of its injustices and has the population believe that Peru is a country that is in transition towards developed countries and it hides the true faces and the true numbers of the, the poverty in which most Peruvians live so that you can have an idea, even though have been 
there have been 500 years from the Westerners having arrived in these lands. From then, the Peruvian state, first the monarchic uh, government, and then the Republican one, they have not been able to install clean water, nor the possibility of taking dirty water outside of the rural areas of Peru. And of course, the living quarters of Peruvians, both the rural ones and the city ones, do not have heating. Most of them don't have water or, or dirty water. Nor, uh, and also in the regions where there's a lot of problems with lack of heating, uh, temperatures can go down to 10 degrees before uh, below zero centigrade. There is no heating. So Peru is a country that has a gross domestic product that increases every year, but nonetheless has a living level that is subhuman both in rural areas as in the city. This, this of course has the consequence that the justification that this, sub, this system produced by the governing classes is made on the basis of McCarthyism. They say that those that want to discuss these systems, the system are communists and that they want to have in Peru uh, a system that resembles that of Cuba or Venezuela. In fact, during the last uh, election, there many millions were invested against communism and that, that campaign continues to this day. Jacob Fujimori, who was candid a candidate excuse me, a candidate, she, she has a position, a political position that, that uses, uh, that accuses the Peru Libre as, as communists and terrorists and of wanting to take Peru uh, to a system that is similar to that of Peru, uh, that of Venezuela, and Cuba. That has been the campaign. And this has been made worse because given that she lost the elections, Keiko Fuhime Mori, she, she takes hold of, of the of Congress as she was there and she she uses this Congress to exert power and that's how they managed to, uh, to, to manage my resignation through the Congress and also through newspapers and now they're asking for the resignation of several other ministers in a way to, to subject uh, Pedro Castillo to what, uh, what they call the right, but really it's, it's not really a right. It's, it's more like a group of mafias whose ultimate objective is to destroy uh, President Castillo via a vacancy. That's what I can say, but in reality, what I'm doing is repeating something that you probably already know, and I would rather listen to your questions so that I can detail or, or be more precise and update the information on the political situation in Peru. Thank you very much, and I'll leave it here, and I will, I will reserve myself to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hector Beja. I would like to give the opportunity to Professor Fred Mills so that he can have an interaction with Hector Beja. Uh, he has some questions for you. Professor Beher, I appreciate this opportunity. 
I'm excited to participate in this webinar and, and have a chat with you. It's really an honor. The topic of racism and its relationship with uh, in social and ec economic inequality is a prominent topic in the United States. Can you tell us something with regards to the role of racism in Peru and how it impacts the diversity of nationalities and indigenous peoples in the current politics? Well, uh, should I answer each question as it comes? Yes. So the topic of racism in Peru. Racism in Peru was implanted from the colonial, colonial era. As you know, we've had 300 years of colonial domination from Spain. And during those 300 years, Peru was divided into what was called the Spanish Republic and the Indigenous Republic. It was an apartheid. It was prohibited, it was forbidden for the Spanish to marry the indigenous peoples. And a public office was reserved only for those that were pure in blood. The main professions were also uh, reserved for them. It was understood by purity of blood to have uh, inheritance purely from Spaniards. No indigenous blood, no black blood, because Peru also had a population of African slaves. Uh, the traces that this colonial uh, system left can still be seen today. So in Peru, the, the language that is spoken is Spanish Castilian. Quechua is a language that is spoken in the Andes and a part of the, the people speak it, but it's, it's considered a second class language. It's not elegant to speak it. It's elegant to speak Spanish. And Quechua was recently made official in 1970 by the government, the progressive government of General Velasco. But in practice, once Velasco falls because his government only had seven years, it returned to what it used to be. So in this, at this point in time, if someone an inhabitant that speaks uh, Quechua, if he wants to go to trial, he has to speak in Spanish because all trials are in Spanish. Schools are taught in Spanish and bilingual uh, schools because this bilingual education was uh, instated 10 or 15 years ago. These schools are that teach Spanish as the fundamental language and Quechua as a secondary language. That is, so they're bilingual, but nonetheless, kids that speak Quechua have to learn in Spanish. This is very much more dramatic in the case of Amazonian languages and the Aymara language. We have close to 40 Amazonian languages, different ones, that in practice aren't accepted in official schools, but only in bilingual schools that are, are Amazonian. So you also have to consider that this racism is reflected also in the way in which the city is organized. So the population, the middle class population or a high income population lives in certain areas in Lima and other cities that have asphalted streets, whereas poor populations live in, in higher areas with no water or in deserts. Lima houses have one, one door for the people that work there, for servants, and another door for the people that live there. And in Lima, 
there's almost 200,000 home workers that don't have any right, but don't have any schedule for work are semi-slaves of the, the, the women, the, the people that, that live in the house. Well, if there are different expressions of this racism, this apartheid, in which the society, the society in Peru lives to this day. Well, thank you for that answer. Another question that is linked with this, there have many, there have been a lot of debate in the circles that are studying the liberation policy with regard to the concept of the people, what it means and how it can't be limited to the working class. So Maria Peggy wrote about how the reality of who teaches that uh, the social block sh should become the subject of the economic transformation and it should include all the victims of colonialism. Could you comment on, on the relevance of Maria Pegui's thought in, in the current politics of Peru? Yes. Well, Maria Pegui analyzed the topic of the economy, the educational topic, the cultural topic, the topic of decentralization, as well as others. In the beginning of an analysis of the Peruvian reality, in his second book, which was which came after his seven essays, it was lost, it's not known. And Maria Tegui, as you know, died young, very young, in 1930, the beginning of that year. He left then a reflection that was very, uh, it was an initial re reflection, and it has been followed, sadly, merely partially but other by other intellectuals in the left and also it has been continued from the perspective of literature via a certain or several novels uh, by several different authors Jose Maria Argueda and other narrators that have been going more deeply into what Maria Tegui said about Peru. Peru is in a process of, in a process of an accelerated growth, a quantitative growth of the population. In 1940s, we, are, we were 6 million people. In 2021, we are 32 million. And by the end of the century, we will be 100 million. Therefore, there is a quantitative growth, an accelerated one. And there's also, there is a, an intense migration internally and an intense process of urbanization that has not been accompanied by the growth of the citizenship and that makes the pro problem of inequality and in apartheid more acute inequality in income uh, in types of uh, uh, access to food inequality of access to the market because poor populations can't go to the markets in the same conditions that the rich population can so the, the problems that we know, and we can say that what we can call citizenry, that is the, the group of people or population that has individual and collective rights has not been achieved in Peru yet, but it is in the process of being constructed and a phenomenon like we've 
we just spoke of, the triumph of a candidature such as Pedro Castillo's means part of the construction of that citizenry because there's a sector of the population in Peru that is being freed of the dominion of the, of the classes of the political parties that have dominated the political system in Peru. The political system has been broken and an enormous contingent, contingent of people that used to be uh, outside of, of the, the main uh, area and didn't really propose its own on people. The people are learning to win their own elections. And that's a, a, a Peruvian phenomenon at, phenomenon at this point. A final question. There are many uh, artists, uh, activists in the US that are participating in this webinar and they respect the sovereignty of Latin America and the Caribbean. And they saw the election of Pedro Castillo as a decisive blow with regards to attempts to resuscitate the group of Lima with having you in the foreign ministry gave some hope with this. There's some uncertainty now with regards to yeah to Peru's coming political foreign policy, will it support uh, the dialogue being carried out in, in Mexico with regards to Venezuela? Can you please tell us what you feel about this? My impression is that there is a vacancy there, there's, there's space there. It's still not known whether the policy of, of Latin American integration and, that's, and support for the initial dialogue in Mexico will continue. It's not possible to foresee it, whether that is going to be positive or negative. And I will reserve my opinion until I see what the conduct will be and what Peruvian foreign policy will be now, given uh, after I have resigned. Mind. It's also evident that in Latin America, what used to be the group of Lima, it doesn't exist anymore because López Obrador has initiated a, a foreign policy that's different in Mexico, which is respectful of the sovereignty of peoples as well, uh, Alberto Fernandez has done this as well in Argentina and of course Arce in Bolivia. Chile is in a process of, uh, an electoral process of changes. Colombia is in very grave internal troubles. So, it seems that the foreign policy in, for Latin America will be oriented towards a new, a new force towards integration, especially considering that Bolsonaro's government is in its last days and that if Lula is the, the first option if they allow him to participate in the coming elections in Brazil. If Lula were to win, evidently Latin America will come again to a vigorous uh, policy of integration. And we hope that Peru with the government of Pedro Castillo will accompany that policy. But at this point, we're in a parenthesis. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Professor Fred Mills.
we have a Professor Behar, we have a series of questions from friends that have been listening uh, since the webinar began. And uh, many of them have a series of questions. I'll read some of them. Here we have, for example, Medea Benjamin says, thank you very much. To Professor Behar, can you speak about the opposition? You've described a bit about, about the opposition that would, uh, the position, sorry, that the Peruvian foreign minister is likely to take. We also have Mariano Mujo Salias. What is your position on the uh, Minister for Work having also come out of, out of offices is a member of the cabinet that could potentially go out and already. So I'll just do these two. Yes, with regards to the new foreign minister, I have don't I, I don't have an opinion. He is a, a diplomat or has been Many years, and he was a foreign minister for Toledo, as you know, was from 2000 to 2005, 2001, 2006, and he has been well. He's a democrat. He, he's a diplomat. He was a career diplomat. The Peruvian constitution, which is that it's the president of the country that that has that directs foreign policy. And well, let's hope or let's let's hope that Pedro Castillo does this. At this point, there is no indication that he will. As I said, we're in a parenthesis, and and I I can't give an opinion. What was the second question, please, if you can remind me? The second one was with regard to the Minister of, of Work. Well, there, uh, what you can find is a succession of ministries that the right is requesting or demanding that they change. It's around four or five ministries, including the, the president of the Council of Ministers. So, well, you, you can't really know what the reaction will be from the president until now, the president, until the presentation of the cabinet in Congress, the president ratified his confidence in the cabinet, but we don't know whether that's going to continue or whether he's how he's going to answer to that pressure. The pressure is really strong and it's being developed uh, from the media and we don't know what the, the conduct of the government is going to be. I have a question that I, that I believe is very important. You said that one of the reasons that you are taken out of office as a foreign minister is was your position with regards to Venezuela. Could you speak a little bit about this topic? And just as I went into office, I, I pointed out in, in my first public speech that I was, that I incorporated through fully to the UN policies. UN policies have condemned, reiterated yeah, very many times, unilateral, unilateral sanctions. And the academia in the US, including the University of Chicago, in successive studies have demonstrated that sanctions, unilateral ones, don't have any other uh, result 
than making the, the people suffer. And they don't have the political or that, the, that those who defend these tactics would like. What is political change? And they haven't achieved that. Look at Cuba, look at Venezuela, President Maduro continues to be in power despite all of the fat sanctions. So on one side, the sanctions have not had the results they wanted and those that impose them uh, have only achieved the suffering of people, including those who are in the opposition, in the case of, of Venezuela to Maduro, those that have to leave Venezuela. And the consequences of Peru have been that we now have to uh, have uh, more than a million refugees from Venezuela. So obviously, Peru cannot be in, cannot support actions in the case of Venezuela, and in in harmony with that policy, I established a policy of normalization of communications with Venezuela. I received uh, Foreign Minister Arreaza, who was here, and we were going to begin the conversations uh, with regards to the reestablishment of a normal embassy in Peru. Given that Peru was the, it was the administration of Kuczynski that requested that the ambassador for Venezuela to leave Peru, I was about to ask for the, the incorporation of an ambassador to Venezuela or the return of a Venezuelan ambassador because at the moment there's only a consulate in Peru. So in that course is, is when I received the resignation and that process has, has been left uh, as it was. Up till this point, I hope that this process is continued, but of course, there is no symptom that that will happen up till now. We have two other questions, Professor Beha. We have, they're asking us what the risks are uh, of, a, of a military coup in Peru, given that, that a, when you present your resignation, well, you were practically threatened by one of the one of the areas of uh, the armed forces. Well, I believe that the circumstances that my resignation was the product of a meeting between the heads of the armed forces and the president of the, of the country, that would be an interference that is illegal and unconstitutional on the part of the armed forces. The, the Peruvian constitution establishes that the armed forces are not deliberative and the president of the country is in charge of these affairs. And therefore, the heads of the Marine Corps, the Army and the Aviation have no right to interfere in the naming or, or the resignation of any ministries. The only ones that can do that are of the Council of Ministers and the President of the country. Those are the, the constitutional norms and they've been broken. But from there, uh, for you to consider that there may be a military core coup, well, in all Latin American countries, there's also that, that risk, but that danger may exist. But for that to become a reality, there is a, a very big distance because uh, in particular, we're not in the 1970s and the experience of Bolivia has shown that it's not easy to carry out a coup. In this point in Peru, I think that if, if they 
come to think that, to, that they should uh, carry the coup, there would be a strong popular reaction. I think the, the danger is there, but but I, I don't believe that the, the distance, distance between the danger and actuality of, of a coup requires uh, elements that are not present in the political scene in Peru at the moment. A question from Orinoco Tribune. What possibility is there really for there being a constituent assembly in Peru? Very few, very few possibility. There are very strong uh, mafias that don't want this because it, it's not convenient for them. This constitution would prohibit the activities uh, from uh, the current constitution uh, makes the, the, the state not valid for economic uh, affairs. It, it doesn't have uh, nautical transport or any other uh, any other possibilities. So, for example, we can't bring vaccines. We depend on bodegas of the private firms that are currently uh, unable to do it given the, the pandemic. So Peru can't establish emergency operations because one, it doesn't have, uh, the state doesn't have transportation ways, nor does the state have the facility or the strength to intervene given the emergency, the, the private companies. The mentality doesn't exist from the government for that, nor the social awareness for that. So it's believed that, and it's a, it's a general thought, that the state should not intervene uh, private companies. That's a problem. It's a very serious problem because we could actually say, well, if, if you don't have your own companies, for, for emergency reasons, you could apply the law. The law establishes that you could intervene uh, private uh, airplanes and private companies for a particular transportation ones, and you could, for example, bring vaccines given the emergency. But no one would think to do that because there exists a, a type of of harassment from the media against the state uh, being able to, to carry out these operations that are quick in the defense of health of the population in Peru. Another question, um, I would really like it if you could speak about Vladimir Serron, who Against him, there have been very ferocious from Fujimorists. And it seems that, well, he's head of Peru, Peru Libre, sorry, I haven't said that. And it seems that there's a, a campaign directed towards neutralizing his performance in public in Peru. Could you describe what, why these attacks are happening and a bit who, about who Vladimir Serron is. The judicial process, in other words, the judges uh, <laughs> making politics uh, into to a, judicial, a judicial problem uh, began very many years ago. And politics, the, the political discussion was developed in a medium at very many levels, sometimes justifiably so, and sometimes not. Almost all uh, 
as leaders that have participated in different uh, electoral processes or in fights uh, with regards to their land or in mining issues or issues with regards to uh, working rights or in defense of the Amazonian communities with, uh, with respect to the mining companies, most of them have been judicialized. Most of them have been annulled or, is, or they are either in jail or uh, forbidden to speak by the judges. And one of those is Serum. But additionally, given that Serron is the head of the winning party, as you've said, there's been a furious daily campaign from the media. Serron is accused of being corrupt, communist, Marxist, Leninist. Being communist in Peru now is equivalent to being a criminal and being a Marxist Leninist is, is the top of, of evil. Marxist Leninism is the, the highest grade of perversion to certain media in Peru. And it's the media that can, that is every day. So Peru suffers from archaism that's correct of the Cold War and I'll say that it's even more violent than during the Cold War. That is, that is the, what can be felt. I have had a conversation with Mr. Sarron. I, I don't know him much. I've seen him possibly a few times, a couple of times, but I, I believe and I and my company, all of well, his viewpoint with regards to that campaign that against him is has interests, and it's destined or it's aimed at getting him out of of, of the political scene and to and to make it so that he can't participate in politics, because any condemnation or any trial against him could possibly get him out of politics for 10 years. So it's not a campaign, and it's not any campaign. Before, in the 1930s or 40s, they would jail you. Now, they, they send, send you to trial. So it's, it's much like happened Lula, yes, yes, it's exactly the same methodology. Well, there's a lot of questions. There's someone asking about some mil military bases that you said could be closed in Peru. I don't know if something like that, uh, whether you had a conversation with regards to this, Yes, the, the topic of the military base is a secret in Peru. The, con the, the Congress has been giving authorization uh, for the transit of people uh, from, from outside Peru. It, it's given that authorization many times during the previous governments. And we don't know what significance that has, what meaning it has. And of course, that information is not available to the public. Nobody uh, is asked for it. So it's a state secret because you had to, you would have to ask for it in Congress, and you would have to ask the Ministry of Defense. Well, Professor, we're reaching the end of this webinar. I'd like to simply open open the stage so that you can say some words and and I know that there are, there are many people would like to to know how they can contribute and support Peru in this process of change that, that it is living. 
I will start with the second. It's very important. Uh, international politics is very important in Peru for many reasons. First, because Peru is a country that is closed in on itself. The Peru and TV stations in Peru uh, are closed in, and, and for them, the world doesn't exist. It's a, it's a type of censorship. Peru is a country that doesn't, doesn't consider the world. Uh, things that happen in the world are not analyzed in Peru. So information that can come via the internet breaking this blockade because in reality it's a blockade uh, a media blockade that doesn't happen from the outside in but rather from the inside out it's a blockade and in, in the in, it's a blockade from the, the blockaded the outside, but the right is blockading from the inside. It causes the population to know what is going on outside. So that blockade needs to be broken. I think we can do it. So that's why this, this uh, meeting is very important to me. Uh, at the same time that we, we that I meet with friends from Europe, Asia, Africa, so it's very important. That, and that's the first place. I also believe that it's important that Peruvian governments think about uh, foreign policy. I have been quite careful of my opinions in this meeting because my opinions are seen in Peru watched in Peru and the enemy media has a, the habit of isolating, taking one minute or two of what I say and they publish it in, in the first stage and it appears as though I am attacking the government. What they want is to show a, a government is divided. They want to show a government in which they are divided uh, on the one side, Terron and Castillo, and in my case, they want to present me as a man that uh, is angry uh, for having been forced to resign, uh, that I resent it, and that I am criticizing the, the government. Therefore, I, of course, have my, my I, I'm critical, of course, but that doesn't mean in any way that I am in the opposition. I want to support and collaborate with the government. I don't care if I do it from public office, I will do it always until the last minute. And I, would, I want to reiterate this. They want to present me as an opposition person. I'm not the, the terrorist, terrorist, the assassin, when I say something against Castillo, then I'm not that. It turns out I'm a man whose opinion matters and, and we should put it in the first uh, page of uh, the news, newspaper. So I'm a curious assassin whose opinions are quite interesting. So that's why I'm very careful of what I say, but I, I do want to reiterate my worry because I think that the Peruvian government at this point is accosted by, by this curious opposition that really isn't an opposition, is an obstruction rather. And a, I don't know if the US, they use the, the, the word, bullying it's it's a constant bullying against castillo and his government and in, in that bullying they force the government to pay attention or a hundred percent attention to internal politics and not to think about foreign policy and i think that's very dangerous dangerous for latin america and it doesn't help Peru. um that's that's what i would like to say well, I, we would like to thank you once more for
for participating here and it's been an honor today to have you with us. Definitely in some other time, we would like to repeat this. I would love to. The, the dynamic and what's happening in Peru is extremely interesting and, and it's been very quick and it's very interesting. So I would surely uh, like to chat with you again. And I would like to say to our, our friends who are asking questions that uh, sadly, I only took down the questions that were uh, that were, had been placed in the question and answer section, but we can leave them for the next uh, for the next time. But in the chat, there are very many questions that I've just seen them now. Well, you can blame me because I I didn't see the questions that were in in the chat section, only the ones that were in the question and answer section. And now I would like to. I would like to give the platform to Terry Matson. She is she does a, a program that's called WT. Can I say what the fuck <laughs> is going on in Latin America? Oh, I see. Right. So, what's happening in in Latin America? And she will close this cycle that we started today. And from here on, I will say goodbye. And I would again like to thank you, your thank your presence, and again uh, tell you that we hope to to have your presence again soon. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd I'd be delighted. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So I, I guess I first have to say what an honor it, it has been to be invited to participate in this webinar and an honor to share space with you, um, Senor Behar. Um, I also want to thank um, all of the wonderful co-sponsors that participated tonight. You were so motivating to attract so many people to, to sponsor this event and to participate. And so let me just read to you how many different groups sponsored the event tonight. Alliance for Global Justice, as you know, um, Alberto Lovato, Bolivarian Circle of New York, Chicago Alba Solidarity, Peru Libre of New York, Code Pink, Orinoco Tribune, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Task Force on the Americas, which I must say I'm part of that organization as, as well, Massachusetts Peace Action, Frente Hugo Chavez, uh, Defensa de los Pueblos Vancouver. So um, highly motivating for everyone to participate tonight. For, um, I just want to say, and, and I'm sure that most of you um, watching and participating this evening all know this, but I think uh, it's really important to reiterate the significance of this year's presidential elections in Peru and the election of Pedro Castillo being of the first progressive president for your country. This is significant. And for many of us throughout the Americas, we had our fingers crossed, our toes crossed. We were praying for this <laughs> on election uh, night, the first round and the second round. And it's a real signal of perhaps the return of the pink tide to the Americas. Um, one of the things that um, I think is also very important, and we didn't touch on this so much. This was actually my question, William, in the chat. Um, the president was elected by the provinces, not Lima. And that, I think you have mentioned this, uh, Senor Bejar, in, in several articles, several interviews, you've done the importance of it being the provinces that elected the people and not Lima. And my question in the chat was, what's the significance of the provinces and the, and the social and labor movements that got the president elected because that is an important theme all over the Americas right now, um, the significance of social and labor movements. And I think I would just throw out to you, William, maybe we should do a, um, a webinar on that at some point and <laughs> how it's affecting the Americas. Um, I also thought it was interesting that you described Peru as not right wing politically, but right economically, meaning I'm assuming you mean uh, neoliberal 
economy, which we are seeing throughout the Americas, that the country Peru specifically is being uh, portrayed as advancing, as modern, but the economic structure is masking the poverty, the lack of infrastructure, healthcare, education, all of those things that, by the way, we are lacking in the United States as well. And so we're seeing this clash throughout the Americas of what you say is the right economically, those, the privatization of everything, the control of industries um, by oligarchies or even mafias versus state uh, developed economy, state uh, finance and developed infrastructure projects, including roads, bridges, schools, hospitals. So we see this clash and it's just so inspiring to see um, your president and you speaking publicly, um, speaking about all of this and bringing this, bringing this um, to light. With you specifically, I think we all know watching this evening that what we saw um, against you was what many of us would define as hybrid war, hybrid war via a media narrative and a media control. They think you said there's 14 country, 14 uh, companies or uh, publishers, broadcasters that are of the oligarchy. They control the narrative. And as we know in the United States, that is a very, very difficult thing to break. But here you are speaking with us this evening and so I think it's important to um, equate what happened with you and this media, this pressure on the public opinion and on the congressional opinion to force you to resign. And I think a lot of us would consider that a form of hybrid warfare with, as you mentioned, the end goal being um, to create a vacancy in the presidency and, uh, and, then, and not even wait for another election cycle or anything of that sort. And the other thing that I really, uh, we, I think we all find as hopeful, and you mentioned this, that the, perhaps this is uh, the end of the Lima group, or we're starting to see the Lima group um, disintegrate. I um, currently live in Mexico City. I was here in, in Mexico City when Obras Lobador gave his spectacular discourse on 24 July, um, which as all of us, no, was the, I think, 238th anniversary of Simon Bolivar's um, birth, and it was a spectacular discourse, and in fact, he did call for a substitute or a replacement of the OAS, um, something that was representative of all the people, and perhaps watching the disintegration of the Lima Group will give us all in the Americas the opportunity to create a more just institution. So you and your, and your president represent so much possibility for all of us. And it's just such an honor to have been with you this evening and we so appreciate your time. And um, we look forward to talking with you again and we most certainly uh, will support you in any way we can. So thank you everyone. So wonderful to have all of you join us this evening. Really, um, really a great honor and a pleasure. Thank you, muchisimas gracias. <laughs>